Would you turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Just keep your finger there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is the third part of our annual prophecy update. There is so much to talk about that's related to end times prophecy that I suppose this could just become the end times prophecy church. Let's talk about that every day. And it wouldn't be hard to do, to be honest with you. There's so many interesting things going on in this world. Jesus said he was coming back. God told us that the Messiah would come and then he would go back and then he would come to rule and reign in this world and before that there would be a tremendous time of tribulation which is an old King James word for a really really bad time before Jesus comes back having to do with the wrath of God wrath with a capital W as it were that would be poured out on this earth Prior to the second coming of the Messiah, Jesus, as he returns, seven years, that will be upheaval politically, militarily, demonically, in ways that the world has never seen before, only seen bits and pieces like it. And the Bible uses those in the prophecies to say, hey, do you remember this guy a long time ago, that, that terrible dictator, Antiochus Epiphanes? Yeah, I remember him. Yeah, when the man of lawlessness comes, he's going to be like that guy, except worse. That's how the Bible gives us these prophecies. And there's so many of them in there. And last week, we talked about Ezekiel 38 and 39. Because we see the Middle East about ready to go up in flames. Now, every time it gets real close to the line, it tends to back off. But every time the tide comes in, it comes in a little bit higher. Every time you look at the pieces move, they're a little bit more exact to what the Lord prophesied to us through the prophet Ezekiel and Ezekiel 38 and 39 and other places in the scripture. So it's fascinating to watch and listen to the news. News that if we were 100 years ago, we wouldn't even be getting this news. But it's happening. And it's happening faster and more strong, like a woman in labor, like Jesus said it would. Increasing, increasing in pain and strength and getting closer and closer together like labor pains. This is Jesus' description of it. And that's why it's important to talk about these things because the Lord told us to be ready. He didn't tell us to worry. He didn't tell us to fret. He didn't tell us to dig holes in the ground and cover ourselves. He said, be ready. And as we've been teaching all along, and every time we talk about this, be ready. How? Well, I'm ready. No, be ready like, number one, a bride waiting for a bridegroom. And we've talked a lot about that. But the bride of Christ, the Bible says the church is Christ's bride. This is the way that God sees you, the church. People that follow him everywhere. That's Jesus' bride. And one day the bridegroom is going to come for the bride. And the bride has to be ready. And the Bible teaches this over and over again prophetically. For the bride to be ready because in Galilee, in ancient Galilee, you never knew when the bridegroom was going to come for the bride. She had to be ready. And then we're to be like a bridesmaid. Different than a bride. But the bridesmaid took care of the bride. Well, what do we do while we wait for Jesus to come? We keep ourselves pure. We keep ourselves ready. We keep the veil on like the bride that says, I have kept myself pure from my bridegroom purity in the church. Again, we've talked about this so much and a little bit more today, by the way. Seems to be an option or a debatable point. There's no debate at all. The Bible says what it says. It means what it means. Keep yourself pure. Be holy as I am holy, the Lord told us. Wow. We like to add a word, but. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about this this morning a little bit, but, you know. No, there are no buts in this. You just keep yourself pure like a bride, but then the bridesmaids. Keep the bride pure. We keep each other. We help each other out. When the bridegroom comes for the bride, unexpectedly, the bride is sleeping in her wedding gown. The bridemaid, bridesmaids make sure there's no dirt or dust on her wedding gown, that there's no wrinkles, that the bride's makeup is in place because they did wear makeup back then for, for their bridal occasions and what have you. That's what they did. And then you've got, of course, be ready. 
like the investment that's been put into you by God. What is that? That the, the spiritual gifts he's given us. What has God given you that could benefit others, strengthen others, have compassion on others, his compassion on others? What has he placed in you to minister to others? And that's the parable of the talents that we find out. Talent was a weight of money, not a talent like an ability to play violin or something like that. Well, what does he put in us? And different degrees, sure, some people have a lot of that and some people have a little, but God wants a return on all of it that while we wait for him, that we're taking care of each other and that we're giving out from whatever God has given us with whatever spiritual gift it might be or ability or, or provision to take care of each other while we wait, while we wait. And then, of course, lastly, be a servant to serve one another. Take care of one another. How good it will be in that day when the master returns and finds his servants doing as he commanded them. And what was that? Taking care of each other. There you go. We said that last week. We said it the week before. That's even the punchline of today. So, you know, I don't have to go over all of that again. I just may mention it at the very end. But remember, we talk about these things, not just to talk about them. We get excited. Jesus is coming back. That's good enough. But Wow. What do we do while we wait? And that's how you occupy until he comes. Today, things are ramping up in this world. I'm very cautious, as you know, and as I've said many times, about saying this is that. You know, a really big one is the mark of the beast. Well, it's a global economy with a subdermal microchip put in your right hand to your forehead and all of that. Really? Does the Bible actually say that? It doesn't. Could it be? Yes, it certainly could. But does it say that? No, it doesn't. It talks about something different. It talks about the mark of the beast being who you worship during those last days of the world. And the Antichrist is going to demand that worship the way that the emperors of Rome demanded it back in those days of every subject of the empire. And if you didn't worship the emperor, nobody bought from you, nobody sold to you. They would starve you out until you did it, until you complied. Today, we're seeing things in this world moving more and more in that direction. First of all, persecution in the world against Christians is ramping up. Now, persecution against Christians in this world has been around since just after Pentecost. The first people persecuted were Jews who were followers of Jesus the Messiah being persecuted by other Jews. This is not an anti-Semitic thing. It was just the reality of that day. And then afterwards, years later, decades later, along comes guys like Nero, who begins to persecute Christians who are not only Jews, but Gentile converts to Christianity and putting blame on them for burning Rome and all of this sort of thing. And they end up in arenas and all of that. And this goes on for 300 years, on again, off again, on again, off again, on again, off again. Today... You're hearing about persecutions happening in places like Nigeria, where whole churches are being massacred on a Sunday morning. God help us, it may have already happened again today because it tends to happen on somewhat of a regular basis. Christians are being persecuted in some very odd ways that we would never think of as persecution. In countries that gave up on persecution for a while, like Russia. You know the country where it's one of the hardest places in the world to be a Christian outwardly? Israel. Yeah, that's a, that's a showstopper, isn't it? And there are other places in this world, anywhere from Muslim countries to atheist countries to, to Catholic countries, where Catholics, uh, you know, especially in certain countries in South America and even Central America, will per persecute non-Catholics. The church gets persecuted and regularly. But the big one that's happening right now, and I'm going to bring this up for a very interesting reason. You'll figure it out really quick why I'm bringing it up, is China. 
Now, China has a revival breaking out in it, and it has had a revival breaking out in it for a number of years. There are anywhere estimated, and the estimations are extremely loose, but you will hear at least 100 million born-again Christians in China, in other words, they're not part of the authorized church for the Chi authorized by the Chinese government, to as many as 200 million, some people say even more. That's a lot of, not, not just Christianized people, but on fire Christians. And they have to endure a lot of pressure. Now, China has somewhat moved on from break the door down and arrest everybody and take them off to prison or take them out and shoot them. They moved on from that to something else that's very interesting. Now, I want you to bear with me on this because it sounds very technical, but let me kind of go through this with you, okay? It's something that they are working on that they have started to implement called the social credit score. Have any of you guys ever heard of the social credit score? It's an interesting thing. It's been in development for several years in China, and it's being scrutinized by the rest of the world, including the U.S., as a very interesting thing. Not necessarily a bad thing in the eyes of many governments. Aspects of it in the U.S., in Europe, in Asia, not necessarily something that's bad, but something that could be very useful. What is the social credit score? Vice President Pence said this about it. He said, the social credit score will allow the trustworthy to roam everywhere under heaven while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step. What's that all about? The trustworthy can do what they want, go where they want, buy and sell what they want. The people that are not trustworthy, the discredited, they won't be able to. Well, wait a minute. That sounds almost Mark of the Beast-ish, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? The trustworthy. Who are the trustworthy? It depends on who's in power in that particular government, who they deem as trustworthy. The people who are not trustworthy are the people whom that government deems as out of their favor or not holding, shall I put it this way, to the party line. Now this is China. This is China. And what they've done is they've implemented facial recognition systems. If you don't know what that is, okay, this is my phone right here. Now, if I want to get into my phone, all I have to do is look at it. It recognizes my face and a little lock unlocks on top. And now I can get into my phone and I can use it. But if you don't have my face, you ain't getting into my phone. Facial recognition. But of course, a lot of bad people around the world and in America, other parts of the world, other countries, are getting caught because you have closed circuit cameras all over the place, rapidly growing population of closed circuit cameras, hundreds of millions of them in the UK, and uh, you know, just because of crime and all of this stuff, that have facial recognition technology attached to it. Now this isn't rumor, this isn't Jay's paranoia or stuff, this is just the reality of, of um, crime prevention, uh, law enforcement, facial recognition is a growing thing because computers can do that. And they can look at your face and say, oh, we know who that person is. You commit a crime, they can track you down a whole lot more easily. Facial recognition in China is now mandatory if you want to get a license of any sort, a phone of any sort. If I was in China and I wanted to go get a phone, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to say, we need to get a facial recognition print of your face. Not for the phone. For the government, they want it. Social credit score attaches your face to something else that is monitored in China. Happens to be internet activity and viewing habits. Now, if you're on the internet, and many of you have white enough hair where it's probably not that important to you. 
But if you're younger, you're on it all the time. You see all the jokes about people walking down the street doing this. Because that's what we do, isn't it? It's just our habits anymore. But everything that you do, that you look at, that you purchase, that you search for on the internet, I, I'm sorry to tell you this, there's a record of it. Everywhere in the world, there's a record of it. You say, Jay, this is paranoia, it's scary. No, it's just the technological reality of today. The internet forgets nothing. Everything is there. Even the stuff that you tried to erase, it's still there. What you buy online, what you sell online, you go to Amazon, you do a search in a particular category for a product, but you never buy that product. What happens the next time you go onto the Amazon site? Boom, there's the product that you were searching for, even though you didn't buy it, saying, would you like to buy this? The internet never forgets. Social media posts. Are you on Facebook? Are you on Instagram? Are you on something else? All your viewing habits, your searches on all the social media is all remembered on the internet. Your posts, your habits, your beliefs, because you express them perhaps through social media, you put up a scripture, ah, a Christian. Uh, your, <laughs> your contacts, your entire address book, if it happens to be online somewhere, it's going someplace else. Once again, not paranoia, digital reality of this age. Now, right now, it starts off not with the government saying, we're going to get you. Or some, you know, the Antichrist out there, we're going to get you. It starts with the bottom line, money. It's all about somebody somewhere wanting to earn a profit. People getting together and then saying, let's form a corporation because we can earn great profits. Things like Amazon and what have you. I buy stuff from Amazon. I'm not saying don't. I'm just, I'm just saying this is the reality of what's going on. And these habits now come into play where the corporations have it, but they also, bottom line is money, they will sell that information to other corporations, entities, individuals who can pay the money for it, and governments. And you say, well, I never gave them permission. Remember every time you fill out something on the internet and you have this thing called the End User License, EULA, a license agreement, EULA, right? Check the little box, I agree. You ever read the fine print? Never. It's all in there. The big print giveth and the fine print taketh away. <laughs> that End User License Agreement that when you fill anything out on the internet, no matter what it is, if you're putting in information, you're going to check a box, I agree with the terms of this agreement. I agree with the terms of this transaction. I agree with the terms of this website. It's in there that they can sell this stuff. That's how that gets out there. China comes along and says, we got a lot of stuff. And they not only have it from the Chinese, they have it from all over the world. But especially with the Chinese. And they collect files on people. Here are their habits. Here's what they buy. Here's the people they have contact with. Here's their religion, or if they have religion at all. And if they're a Christian. And part of this is now they have the facial recognition. They have the information on you. And so you're driving down the road and you run a stop sign, so to speak. Well, that's an infraction. Well, they, and they find the infraction. It comes digitally to the government. The government puts a point on your license. Until you get a certain amount of points, they take your license away. Now, if you happen to have a religious infraction, that is a point against you, too. And you get up enough of these points, you hang out with enough Christians, you quote enough scripture, something goes up online and it happens to be something having to do with Christ or the church or your beliefs that are outside their control and their purview. 
then they won't give you a driver's license, they won't give you a passport, they won't let you buy train tickets or plane tickets or take a cab ride. And they can prevent all of this because the information goes out. Now that's China. That's the social credit score. And if you're found not to hold to the party line politically, socially, or morally, you will be socially managed, they called it, through various restrictions, sanctions, penalties for participating in unapproved activities, which is involving blacklisting, punishing, blocking, coercing, restrictions on procurement and business licenses, less favorable in interest rates for you, better interest rates for somebody who is cooperating with the system and the party line, and possible restriction from overall purchase. Now, imagine, imagine you're a Christian right now living in China. How do you like that thought? And the world, technologically speaking, the whole world is set up for that system to be implemented anywhere where there's technology in this world today. Imagine that falling into the hands of a person that we know in the Bible as the Antichrist, who will receive, once again, much longer study, which we're not going to touch, not today, how he gets into power and becomes the most influential man in the entire world. And if you don't go with his party line, nobody can buy Nobody can sell until you do, just like they did with Rome without the technology. In the last several years, the Internet has been handed over to international supervision under President Obama. He let it go. Amazon has 300 million customers. If you ever bought anything on Amazon, you're one of those numbers. <laughs> Facebook, 2.8 billion people on Facebook. I'm one of them. Why am I there? I don't like to argue with people about anything. It's a great place to put up sermons. And people listen to them. Hundreds of people, and sometimes even thousands. It's a great place to let people know about Jesus. I don't argue politics. What a waste of time to do it there because it doesn't do anybody any good. But it is a good place to get the good stuff out to people who might be wasting their time with other things or involved in other things that are fairly godless. I'm not talking about Christians. I'm just talking about people who are there. Well, Facebook is now considered by the youth of this world for old people. And it's gone to Instagram. Instagram has 500 million in that social network. Google has 1.5 billion with 7 billion searches by individuals every single day. 7 billion searches a day. Data is mined from internet searches, <coughs> cell phone usage, various apps and online memberships. Those are your EULAs, E-U-L-A, your end user license agreements where you check the box. From your buying habits, data is mined from that. Closed circuit TV with facial recognition cams, which are increasingly everywhere. Anything inputted by you or about you into any computer anywhere in the world is logged. This is not to scare you or to make you stop. It's too late. The deal is that you use it for the kingdom or the enemy will use it against you. And that's probably a sure thing too. But either way, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, boy, if the wrong person got a hold of this, how they could control the world and how they could really persecute those who would oppose him. Jesus is coming, folks. Jesus is coming soon. Oh, one last little footnote. This is happening in China. Turkey is now looking very seriously into it. And you think the U.S. hasn't looked seriously into this? Hmm. Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
First Thessalonians, excuse me, Second Thessalonians, turn right a few pages. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, we're going to read down to verse 17. Verse 3. Paul speaking to the church at Thessaloniki or Thessalonica. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come. What's that day? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord's return. And it's not just a 24-hour period, by the way. It's an event. The day of the Lord, think of it not like a day, but an event. Will not come until, key word, the rebellion which is what we're talking about today. It will not come until the rebellion occurs. We have another word for that, that unfortunately in our modern day and age is somewhat of an obsolete word, but it's a very, very good word, and it's an important one. Until the apostasy occurs. In other words, a turning, deliberate turning of the back on truth. Until a rebellion against God, a rebellion against his truth. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. And the man of lawlessness, that's the Antichrist, is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. Just a side note on the man of lawlessness. Fascinating that they would call the Antichrist that, especially in our country and surprisingly, shockingly, in our state, the state of California, that lawlessness is what lawmakers are allowing. Isn't it a strange irony? Lawmakers are facilitating lawlessness. The man of lawlessness, it kind of tells you in our modern world what that looks like by looking at what's coming around the corners here in California. That that which is really, really important in the Bible is considered unimportant anymore. That laws are unenforceable by our police and police have become the villains. A catastrophe. And yet lawmakers are making laws to that effect. Isn't that strange? Very strange irony. Anyway, the Antichrist is the man of lawlessness. We're just getting a flavor of it here. Until he's revealed in the man doomed, uh, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped and even sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. This is the Antichrist. He's coming. I do not believe we will be here when he sets himself up in this manner. I happen to believe in the rapture of the church not because I just happen to believe it that way but I think there are scriptural precedents that demand it. But I'm not talking about that today. I'm just mentioning it because that is a whole other big Bible study. Verse 5. Paul goes on. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? No, don't forget them. And now you know what is holding him back. The Antichrist. So that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness. Wow, it's a spiritual movement that is blind to the world, or the world is blind to, rather. The secret power of lawlessness is already at work. Can you see it? We can. We got the Bible. We compare it to what's going on in the world. We say, not too secret to us, to the rest of the world. It's just going by, and they don't even see it. Spiritual war. The secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit in the church, by the way. And then the lawless one, there's the Antichrist again, will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Yeah, he's bad, but Jesus is a whole lot bigger. All he's got to do is show up and say, I'm here, you're gone. That's it. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders. Miracles, signs and wonders, but they're all fake. And in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. 
They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them, refuse to love the truth? Maybe you're listening to this in a recording online or watching it on, on YouTube because we record it that way. Maybe you're watching that and say, well, I don't want that truth. Okay. God says in the end, here's what's going to happen. You don't want that truth? You refuse to love the truth and so be saved? This is, you say, this is a threat. It's not a threat. It's a dire warning. God is telling the truth. Get saved. I've given you every opportunity. I gave you my only son. Put your faith in him. Be saved. From all eter for all eternity and from hell and to God and to his goodness and his righteousness and so forth and so on. All those churchy words that you might be afraid of. They perished because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. And for this reason, and here it comes, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Why do people follow after the Antichrist in the, old, in the Bible when you read it? The prophecies about the Antichrist, the end times, the tribulation. Why do they continue to worship Satan even though these catastrophes and God's wrath is coming on the earth at that time? Because they're put in there by God, a delusion. You refuse to believe the, to believe the truth? Great, then you'll believe the lie. And you won't have a choice. Believe now. Trust now. Put your faith in Christ now. Don't wait. Because there will come a point where God will say, all right then. Have it your own way. Verse 13. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, here it comes to you. Stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. Verse 16, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage and strengthen you for every good deed and word. That's what we do while we wait. Now, this rebellion, this apostasy, this is huge. Now, here's a question I'm often asked. Is America in the Bible. And many people have been trying to find it. Some people say we found it. It's the young lions in a prophecy or it's something else. Maybe it is. I'm not going to say no. Prophecies become clearer as time goes on because things fall into place and you could see, see them starting to focus. But I believe in one very interesting sense at least if the Lord comes back in our imminent future. And we don't know when he's coming back. It could be another thousand years. Oh, Lord, I hope not. But if he comes back in our imminent future, then I am convinced that America has been part of what's going on in this world. Not because America shows up in the scripture, but because of what America has been to the rest of the world and the fact, the unfortunate fact, that as a Christianized nation and with Christians' freedom to be able to go out and be missionaries all around the world and preach the gospel all around the world and with the technological advances that began here that are used to get the word out all around the world, that there has been a revival in this world like nothing that anybody's ever seen before. What happens when America goes into decline? Because that's the fact. We are 
on the decline. It doesn't mean that we can't swing back up again. But with what you see in the end times in this world, you realize the one thing that's keeping the world from actually going right down the drain is the influence of the United States of America and its Christian population. America has been the launch pad for the gospel for the past 200 years. But now, concerning end times prophecy, concerning America, I'm stealing this line from a guy who I think is a fabulous writer and a very great thinker, and he loves Jesus. He said, it's, it's not the enemy at the door. It's the termites in the floor. It's the apostasy, you might say, the rebellion. What are the symptoms? One of them is very interesting. Pastors all over America, I'm not talking about outside of America, I can't account for that, but at least in the U.S., wholesale quitting the ministry, getting out of ministry, not retiring out of it, that happens to the best of us and all of us at some point. I hope I could just die in the pulpit. I don't want to shock you though, but you know. But pastors are quitting the ministry like never before, like never before. Some pastors, high level, big name pastors, are not only quitting ministry, they're quitting Christianity. What's going on there? They have huge influence and it causes people to go, hmm, I wonder. Now that brings up a discussion. Discussions are good because it gets us right down to the nitty gritty of the truth. What are we looking at here? But it also discourages in huge ways people that are considering following Christ or who are new Christians in the church. Well, if they're going to fail, what, what chance do I have? Another big one. Boy, I'll tell you, I'll take you out and stone you for this one. The LGBTQ agenda. It's infiltrating Christian doctrine because the churches are so weak on this subject. There are huge churches all across America, even regionally with us, that refuse to take a stance on this. Because why? Well, we don't want to split our congregation. What's happening in the Methodist church right now? This will be old news by the time a month or two goes by. But the Methodist church, on their high council with their, the heads of the church, you can, you know, ask Methodists this. we got great Methodist church here in town with some great people in it. But you ask them. And the people, the team at the top, they're saying, we need to ordain LGBTQ people and we need to start doing gay marriages. And the rest of the church, the vast majority of people who attend are saying, but the Bible says no. The Bible says it's a sin that needs to be repented of, like any other sin. But it's a social issue that is so virulent. It's a social issue that has so much money, media, and force behind it that if you don't get on board with it, you will be punished. And that is the truth. Unfortunately, we see it every day in the news now. And the punishment comes against people who simply say, but I read in the Bible that which is contrary to what you're saying is truth. Well, that's your truth. Your truth needs to change. No, it's God's truth. The higher-ups at the Methodist Church, uh, Pastor Jim knows this because he was in, actually in on a conversation that he and I was having with a, a very fine man, a good man, who was a Methodist pastor. He's not from here. But when we brought up the subject, he said, but it's okay. Gay marriage is okay. LGBTQ and the other alphabet that's added to it, it's okay. Because he said, our founder said that the Bible contains the truth. It's not the truth, it contains the truth. 
Now, we've talked about this before. There's a big problem in that statement because if the Bible contains the truth, it's up to each of you as individuals to decide what parts are true and what parts aren't. And then what have you got? Nothing. No truth at all, your truth, and as I've said so many times, and we've said together, that if you say, well, this is my truth and that's your truth, fine. When you die, your truth dies with you, and there it wasn't truth at all, because truth is immutable. It just doesn't change. Either the Bible is all truth, or it's not truth at all. That's the deal. However, the churches are leaning more towards that statement that the Bible contains the truth. And that means that you can illegitimately make it say whatever you want it to say so you can believe whatever you choose to believe. And when you have a lot of social, governmental, or uh, uh, special interest pressure being put on you, then we cave in. Because I don't have to fight it. I don't want to fight this battle. Well, it's not a matter of going out and picking a fight. It's just a matter of standing on a bedrock foundation and not slipping off of it. Not stepping off of it. Not moving off of it. But the bullying and the coercing of churches, the bullying and coercing towards Christian colleges and universities, Christian businesses, many of them softening on all of this. I believe that it's part of the end times apostasy because America is the biggest sending entity of Christianity that the world has ever known. And now the termites are eating away at the floor. The examples of this, for instance, just one. This one I've heard from people who have said this, nobody here, praise God for that. But many times been confronted with this. That, did you know that the word homosexual isn't in the Bible? Is it? Do you know this? Do you know where to find it? It happens to be a word that I can't pronounce in the Greek, because I'm not a Greek scholar. But, arsenokoitis, arsenokoitis, something like that? that? That's the word. And actually, the word homosexual isn't in the Bible as homosexual. They had a word for homosexuality that just turned into homosexuality today. With our vocabulary, it was the word sodomite, equated with Sodom. And it is in the Bible. And it's in the Old Testament. And it's in the New Testament. And people are lecturing in public school, trying to undermine the students who might be Christians, saying that it's not even in the Bible. And that when you're hearing all this stuff, you're hearing it from traditionalists and dogmatic people who want to impose their will upon you. But the Bible says differently, and the kids don't have the discipline to go look it up. And that's our future here. America is waning. Church infighting is part of the apostasy. Because of social media, please don't turn the volume down when I say those words. Because of social media and open discussion that is now all over the world, I can get on my phone right now and I can text a guy in Japan if he's awake. <laughs> I mean, I could talk to people all over the world from the pulpit right now. Those of you that are about my age, did you ever think that would come to that? It's astonishing. And yet through social media, churches now air their anger, their differences, their, their opposition to certain things much more openly. It's this way, not just with churches, but people all around the world. And there is civil war within the church. On my Facebook site, with all the friends that I have, most of whom I never met, they just friend you on there and you say, I want them as a friend or not. And I got almost 4,000 friends there. And they are, they, I got guys on there who are, well, fire breathing Calvinists who will tell you that Calvinism is the only way to believe. And if you don't believe that, you're not right with God. And I'm thinking, so what? 
I mean, you believe that God chose me to be saved. Why are you telling me that I have to believe this when, frankly, your belief says that God chose me to be saved and I can't get out of it anyway? <laughs> and yet they're so angry about it. And the anger of these different churches fighting back and forth. Another one, universalism. Heard about that? No, I'm not talking about Universal Studios, okay? Universalism. Universalism is catching fire. I've had to unfriend all these people on my social media site. This is social media testimony day, I guess. Anyway, uh, because they were saying that Christ died once for all. Therefore, everybody, sinners and saints, vile people, Buddhists, atheists, they're all going to heaven. There is no such thing as hell. You say, no, no, no. You got to look at the responses that also come up in the comments. People believe this. Why? Because they want to. Or they want to stay friends with the person because if not, they'll get mad at you and they happen to be very good, usually at coming down really hard on people who dissent. So there is social pressure. Not spiritual, social. And we cave into that. The infighting within the church is an embarrassment to the world. One of the questions that I get asked by Muslims when I have contact with them, and in the Middle East you get a lot of contact with Muslims, they'll say, the church has, I say, I, they, they, you know, I'll tell you why they're not a Christian, usually it's an excuse, but well, the church has all these factions, so does Islam, by the way, but they all fight with each other. Why should I want to become part of that? They fight over doctrine. They fight over traditions. They fight over being, you know, they fight over the, the veracity of the Bible, whether it's all true or partly true. And they fight with each other. And the fight is seen around the world now because of the Internet. And who wants to be part of a civil war? Why should I join this church or that church? Or why should I even become a Christian? All you do is fight and argue with each other. Have you read John 17 lately? Father, I pray that they might be one as you and I are one, as you are in me and I, in, I am in you. May they be in us. Father, I have given them your glory that they may be one as you and I are one. And you notice there's one word not in that whole thing. But. <laughs> it's God talking to God telling God exactly what God wants without any caveats. The church doesn't seem to believe that anymore, and they insert one word that wipes the whole thing out. But. Because there are always loopholes in our minds. And we as Americans love loopholes. The IRS has taught us a lot about that. Diplomacy with the enemy. Softening or being silent on solid, essential biblical doctrines or replacing it with trivial nonsense. The Joel Osteens of this world who will tell you that one day you're going to be thrown into the lake of pancakes and puppies if you don't obey God. I'm sorry, the guy is into self-help, but he doesn't preach you need to repent from your sins. And yet he's got a congregation of how many tens of thousands of people? That's collaborating with the enemy. Other people, the Jakes, the Creflos, the Dollars, not Dale. <laughs> Benny Hinn. Don't trouble your congregations with teachings that might upset them. Sin, repentance, hell, biblical, moral standards, etc. Entertain them. Keep them in numbers. Because why? Because they tithe. <laughs> Useless unbiblical controversies are all over the church. Tangents like people that write to me because I do a lot of stuff with Israel and I have all these videos up on YouTube about site teachings in Israel. And they want to argue about the location of the temple. Angrily. Angrily. There's a new Gnosticism that's growing up. All these different peripheral issues having to do with scripture or doctrine or end times. It has to do with Jesus plus nothing plus nothing plus nothing. 
And yet it tends to go off in the direction of astrology, four blood moons and all of this stuff. They came and they went. You're still here. What does that tell you? <laughs> American values dominating the church and theological discussions is also part of the problem. You say, what? That's un-American of you to say that. No, no, no. In the church, in so many of the churches, the main thing is no longer the main thing, and the main thing is Jesus. But confusion in the church of the American way with biblical doctrine and teachings. Because we're Americans in the church. You ask so many people that say, man, I love it. Yes, we, we, we you think about it as a pastor, you get to put on these glasses to observe all of this stuff that we really as Americans feel that we're entitled to prosperity. You ain't entitled to anything. We were entitled to hell. Jesus saved us out of that because we were all wretched sinners. Political agendas proclaimed by Christians as if they were doctrinal fundamentalism. I got news for you. Your favorite presidential candidate, no matter who they are, is not the second coming. <laughs> they are sinners like the rest of us, and they are politicians like the rest of them. And when in the church, as much as I like these things, did you hear what I just said? As much as I like these things, gun rights, capitalism, patriotism, they're not bad. But none are inherently Christian and none of them are biblical. The Bible was not written in a capitalist society. It was written under dictatorships, emperors, kings, oppression, but nothing like what we have today and no democracy. It's not in there. In the midst of all the political morass, if Jesus was here today, with all that's going on in the news, with all the stuff that we're after, that we're into, in the church, if Jesus was here today, where would you find him? What would you find him doing? Ah, look there. Look there. The kingdom of heaven is nothing like anything the world has ever seen. Christianity from Pentecost onward and during times of great revival gave the world one thing. It wasn't the U.S. Constitution as much as I love that document. It was Jesus. It was Jesus. And another big one as I start to wrap this up. The rapture. The rapture, as I mentioned last week and even the week before, I have never in the church heard so many attacks on the idea of the rapture even being a real thing because why? In our modern rationalistic way of thinking here in this country and outside this country, it just sounds silly. And you don't want to be thought of as silly, do you? You don't want to be thought of as a stupid person believing in a myth that all the Christians one day are just they're going to disappear and they're going to go be with Jesus and then they're going to come back on horses following him. You don't want to really be thought of as believing that, do you? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Why? Because it's here. And it's here in black and white. And it's coming. And it's going to happen. And you say, well, I don't really believe the rapture is in the Bible. As I said before, let me recap it very quickly. Do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? The physical resurrection of the dead? I know you do. Because, in fact, if you look at essential doctrine, not peripheral doctrine, essential doctrine... That if you look at the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, whichever version of it you want to look at, because there are several versions, they all say essentially the same thing, maybe in different ways. And the last point is we believe in the literal resurrection of the dead at the coming of Christ. And here's the problem. One day... 
trumpet shout, voice of the Lord, and it's no problem for God to do this even if people's bodies have been smashed to atoms by a nuke. To pull everyone who died in righteousness, there's another one for people who didn't, resurrection, pull their bodies back together, give them eternal bodies like Jesus that will never die again, that can live in the presence of God and live here on the earth too as necessary. And that you'll have a new body and your soul will be put into that body. Your spirit will live there forever and ever and ever. Amazing thing. What if you're alive when that happens? That's the rapture. Because both places where Paul talks about this, 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, that was their problem. Somebody had been teaching them that the resurrection of the dead had already happened. He said it can't happen that way. Because the thing is, what if you're alive when it happens? You're going to be changed and be caught up with them. Rapture of the church. I don't care what you call it. That's what happens. And yet that's being attacked because we live in such a rational age. And that's part of the apostasy. Thinking ourselves wise. We don't only become fools, we get lost. And so does the church. The decline, and not the downfall, just the weakening of America means the decline of global missions, the decline of unwavering sound doctrine in the West, the decline of Christian credibility because of infighting, the decline of America demonstrated in its leadership in the world, its loss or abandonment of moral resolve, the abortion madness, national unity movement of intolerance against the morally resolved, the rebellion, an end times prophesied Christian vacuum that today is happening, leading to the rise of universalism, ignorance of the influence of things like textual criticism in the universities, which is undermining scripture, intelligent interpretations of the Bible because you don't want to be thought of as stupid, moral hypocrisy, tribalism, subjective hatred, anti-Semitism, emotionalism over reason and abstract thought. Don't hurt my feelings. You offended me. You think that's not in the church? It's everywhere. The decline of America also leads to global political confusion because we used to set the standard. Global leadership is abandoning Christian values. It came with westernization and it came with America in the biggest of ways. Replacing it with the shifting values that promote national instability everywhere in the world. With the decline of America, global leadership is embracing values that conflict with the higher moral nature of people everywhere where they know what's right and what's wrong. An instability that today, today, is causing the world to cry out for a great leader who will put all of this on the same unruffled path. Who doesn't impose biblical laws on us, but lets us have the freedom, not liberty, we're founded on liberty. Give us freedom to do what we want and don't enforce against us. Only enforce against those who cling to those moral values and those biblical values. Who would that be? The man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. Which is why this rebellion, this apostasy is so sinister. You could just flash by reading it and say, no big deal. And you realize it's really, really big deal in these last times. Jesus is coming. And the early Christians knew it. There have also been rumors afoot, and I'm finishing with this. I have to read a couple of things to you, but then we're done. That it really doesn't matter of Christ's return. We've been waiting for it for 2,000 years. So what? Is he really coming back? Well, yeah, he'll come back in his own good time. And, but be ready. Well, kind of ready. There's a document that, now listen to me, it is not 
Let me say it again. It is not, let me say it again. It is not scripture. Got it? This is not scripture. Don't treat it as scripture. But it's a very old document. And it was sort of a procedures manual for the church. It's controversial. But it is real. And it has been around. Some people say as early as 96 AD. Now, that means the temple was destroyed. John, the apostle, was still around at that time, but everybody else was dead. Some people say it was written around 200 AD. But a lot of people say and have been teaching, and it's been, a, once again, part of the, the decline of the church in America that has the influence over all the world to say that it's not important and not urgent that Jesus is coming back. Besides, all of those prophecies they will tell you had to do with the fall of the temple in Jerusalem, the surrounding of the Jerusalem by the armies of Rome, which happened and was prophesied for sure. But that's not, they'll say, end times prophecy. Those things have come and gone. Jesus is coming back, but these things have come and gone. The reason I call upon this document is that some Christian wrote this, and it was used prominently in a lot of churches. This is just a little part of it. On just, what do we do? We're a new church. What do we do? So they wrote this little procedure manual. This is chapter 16. It's short. Well, it's short enough. <clears throat> Watchfulness and the coming of the Lord. That's the subject. Watch for your life's sake. Let not your lamps be quenched, nor your loins unloosed. Be ready, for you know not the hour in which the Lord will come. But come together often, seeking the things which are befitting your souls. For the whole time of your faith will not profit you if you are not made perfect in the last time. If you're not staying true to the Lord, in other words. For the last days, in the last days, false prophets and corruptors shall be multiplied. What have we just been talking about? And the sheep shall be turned into wolves, and the love shall be turned into hate. For when lawlessness increases, they shall hate and persecute and betray one another. And then shall appear the world deceiver as a son of God, the Antichrist, and shall do signs and wonders, and the earth shall be delivered into his hands. And he shall do iniquitous things which have never yet come to pass since the beginning. Then shall the creation of men come into the fire of trial, and many shall be made to stumble and shall perish. That's the rebellion and the outcome of it. But those who endure in their faith shall be saved from under the curse itself. They believed in the rapture. At that time, they believed in the rapture. And then shall appear the signs of the truth. First, the sign of an outspreading in heaven, the sign of the sound of the trumpet, and third, the resurrection of the dead. Yet not of all. But as it is said, the Lord shall come and all his saints with him. And then shall the world see the Lord coming upon the clouds of heaven. This is not scripture, but it was written by a Christian who understood where Christians stood long after Jesus went back to heaven, long after the temple was destroyed and Rome took over Jerusalem. They still believed those prophecies just as we see them in the scripture. And that to me is fascinating. So I finish with this from 2 Peter. About the end of the world. He happens to mention, originally in 2 Peter chapter 3, that yeah, there are people who say, his coming really doesn't matter. It's been a long time. He hasn't come yet. But, he said, with the Lord, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. And it's going to go bad. The world was destroyed by water at one point. It's going to be destroyed by fire at another time. And here's where he picks it up in 2 Peter 3.11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? 
That's the million dollar question today. This is all happening. It's happening around us. It's happening in this world. When is it going to come to a point, to a head? We don't know. But if things keep going the way they are, it can't be much longer. Could it be in God's eye? Sure, it could. But the way things are right now, it's wild and crazy. And since it's that way, what kind of people ought you to be? That's your question. Well, Peter answers it. Good old Peter. You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed, it's coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt with heat. But in keeping with his promise, we, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, are you looking forward to it? Are you? Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul wrote, wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. Hey, he writes the same in all his letters, Peter says. I love this. Peter's a fisherman. Paul's an intellectual, right? He says he writes the same way in all his letters, speaking of these matters. His letters contain, contain some things that are hard to understand, yeah, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you do not be so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And that's the end of his second letter. We live in amazing times. And there are times where they're distressing times. But the common thread that you find is, but rejoice. Because your redemption draws nigh. And don't sit around, as one of my old pastors used to say, on your rusty dusties waiting for something to happen. But be about the Lord's business until he comes. And that too is a big a Amen. Thank you, Lord, for making things clear to us, for taking us on this journey, and that, Lord, we would live in times like we live in today. Lord, we do pray for our country. It is in decline, but we would love to see it turn around. And that's up to you. Revivals start with you, oh Lord. And it's happened before. And we ask that it would break out here. Oh, Lord, how you've touched the world through people completely sold out to you. And this, our nation, which has been a thorn to a lot of people in this world, but has brought about the outpouring of your gospel to the corners of the earth. Lord, come quickly, but heal our land. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.